Um, but our first presenter is Professor Shiwasaki, and um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this presentation because obviously it's actually very much about the current experiment that hopefully many of you are participating in, in terms of the actual demonstration of the Moving Features Standard. So please welcome Professor. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Ryosuke Shibasaki uh, from the University of Tokyo. Actually, I'm supposed to talk about the moving feature standards, or I mean something like this. And uh, actually, at first, let me talk about the current status of this moving feature standard. So TC voting has ended, says free. And uh, anyway, thank you for your support. And uh, actually, we, what we have proposed is the part one and then part two. Part one is uh, based on the XML encoding, and the part two is a simple CSP. And uh, when you look at the detail of the XM core, that looks like this. But if I continue this kind of talk for the next 20 years, probably you may, you may fall asleep and get bored. <laughs> so anyway, let me talk about uh, background, actually. Uh, that could be much, much more enjoyable, and I hope that would be much more I mean, useful. And uh, actually, in the context of the smart cities, the people for are moving features actually uh, play a very key role, or important role, because uh, supporting the movement of people is one of the most important tasks by the urban infrastructure, such as railways or anyway, road networks and something like this. And uh, for supporting the successful planning and also the management of such kind of transportation infrastructure, the main cities conducted a kind of very expensive survey based on the, anyway, questionnaires. So, for example, this is one of the visualizations of such kind of very expensive uh, survey results. And uh, this was done around six years ago, and uh, it consists of 800,000 samples, 3% of the entire Tokyo metropolitan areas. So you may see the different colors corresponding to the transportation mode. And uh, this data, of course, are collected not, by, not with GPS, but by the questionnaire. So the, all the 830 guys are requested to write down, for example, when did you uh, leave home, or anyway, when, uh, which station did you go, by what kind of transportation mode, or anything, something like this. And of course, in the late afternoon, it's, uh, anyway, you may find out uh, some kind of clocks here. Uh, the flow of the people actually go backwards and going back to the suburban areas or to their, for example, homes. It's been working. Hmm? It's been working. It's been ah, yes. Yeah, of course, there are a lot of people working. <laughs> you can find them even around here. But uh, anyway, just. This is very expensive, so the only one day survey for the 10 years. Uh, so that is a very serious limitation. But of course, another strength is such kind of question survey is designed based on the very, let's say, uh, scientific sampling schemes. So by multiplying some kind of scaling factor or magnification factor, uh, we can make a rather, let's say, accurate estimation of the changes of the people distribution, I believe that this movie can provide a more direct answer to that how many people are still working at late at night in the center of Tokyo or anything, something like that. But however, one day in 10 years is, uh, anyway, such kind of data could be used for developing some kind of behavior simulation models and uh, could be useful for supporting the relatively longer term planning of the <coughs> urban uh, transportation infrastructure, such as the new development of the subways or anything, something like this. But uh, not very useful for the daily management, of course, such as the disaster response or anything, something like this. And uh, as you know nowadays, uh, GPS on the smartphones or anyway, just simple I mean, mobile devices uh, becoming uh, cheaper and cheaper. And uh, for example, in case of the GPS, 
uh, from 2007, uh, Japanese government actually uh, put a kind of regulation that the every uh, handset of cell phone should be equipped with the GPS for the emergency call. So then, the uh, navigation services, for example, based on the mobile phone, have gotten so much money popular among the people. And uh, by collecting such kind of data, we can visualize how the people move or behave in the case of the disasters. Uh, in 2011 and March 11, actually, as you know, that we had a very serious earthquake, and uh, uh, northeastern part of Japan was struck by tsunami. And uh, fortunately, the epicenter is a little bit far from Tokyo. However, due to the seismic motion, a relatively stronger one, uh, all the railway system actually stopped the service for safety. So after that, anyway, you may see that we have to walk from the center of Tokyo to the homes of any individual, let's say homes. The, at least it's usually 10 kilometers, sometimes 20 or some person, unfortunately guys, have to walk more than 30, I mean kilometers, like this. <coughs> so actually, such kind of movement can be very successfully visualized by using the GPS data collected through the navigation services. Yeah, of course, this data are collected based on the agreement of the users. And uh, this is just the 1% of the entire population. Uh, because of that service, subscribers is around 1.2 or 3 million in Japan. But nevertheless, you may see uh, a lot of people flows along with the railways in the morning. And uh, actually, 9 a.m. is the uh, office hour, I mean, starting time. And after that, for example, you can identify this is a Tokyo Disneyland. And the uh, earthquake actually happened to 46. So after 2.46 p.m., the railway stops. And uh, actually, everyone have to walk. So you may see the small dots walking relatively slowly along with the trunk road. And uh, such kind of people marching continues until very late at night, even the very early of the next day. And uh, very late at the evening, for example, you may see some of the fast moving, I mean, points, probably at around 11 p.m. or anyway, something like this. Actually, <coughs> it shows the railway services, I mean, resumed along those lines. And uh, those correct, uh, location data corrected for the navigation services, that means this is a kind of real time data stream. But uh, unfortunately, at that time, uh, no one except that navigation company guys uh, knows about this kind of data. So such kind, this data uh, actually, unfortunately, were not used for supporting the uh, anyway disaster responses of the governments or uh, even the railway, let's say, anyway, companies. And uh, similar kind of data actually are collected continuously. So, for example, another events such as the marathon, Tokyo Marathon, actually it attracted around 30,000 people. Uh, the marathon start time would be the 9 a.m. Uh, the start point was at, in front of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government Office. So the, actually the learners got together at the center, anyway, in the front of the Metropolitan Government Office. And at 9 a.m., they start running, and uh, since they have very many uh, runners joined this mountain, so you may see a very long queue or even some sort of the lines of the runners. And uh, actually, those peaks uh, correspond to the density of the runners along with the uh, marathon route. And those pictures are the, I mean, the photos uh, uploaded through the Twitter. And the cross to the goal. Actually, this is the goal, goal point. So even after the four or five hours of the starting time, then many people still running or enjoying running. And after around the 4 p.m., the marathon route was anyway closed. So that is the end of 
the event. Was it also uh, from the cell phone data? Ah, oh, yes, yes. GPS data from cell phones. Yeah. And uh, actually, uh, such kind of randomness density could be a very good feature to de automatically detecting such kind of events like marathons. But when you look at the actually the population density at individual grid cell, uh, again, some other kind of event could be detected like this. Actually, these are representing the time series changes of the population density at this specific grid cell. And this is a sudden jump at a specific day. Actually, that is a kind of firework. And also, the another festival, actually, this is a kind of university campus festival. Uh, ordinary days, of course, the students come to the campus. But uh, this is a Sunday, Saturday, a lot of more people, actually. And uh, such kind of changes of the population density could be very easily detected, something like this. But uh, actually, if you wanted to for example, uh, try to collect some sort of the bias of such kind of data, or uh, make a more in-depth analysis, for example. You may try to identify the clusters of the points, and that could be regarded as a home or workplaces. And actually, such kind of information would be useful for describing or estimating some sort of the user, I mean, the profiles, something like this. And, uh, but of course, such kind of labeling, uh, we need a kind of training data. That is always a big obstacle in making this kind of analysis more reliable, quantitatively. And uh, anyway, these are the kind of user interface of the system for checking whether the analysis is really correct or anyway not. So the, based on such kind of training data sets, the, actually, the Rivalry accuracy will be at this moment 90, for example, percent. But once the home rivals is attached, then we can just aggregate the GPS users for individual administrative zones. And the national census, of course, is available for such kind of zones. Then we can compare. Actually, that help us estimate some kind of scaling factor. So according to this, the Eight, uh, actually, the vertical axis is a uh, national census. The horizontal axis actually a uh, kind of estimated population from GPS. So you may see <coughs> the correlation was not so bad. And uh, this is a kind of scaling factor, 86.165 or something like this. But uh, still, you may find some sort of the outliers. Anyway, actually, these are a kind of night entertainment spot where there are very many, let's say, night time workers uh, anyway stays even until the 4 or 5 a.m. in the, let's say, morning. And uh, when you go out of Japan, actually, still, uh, many people use these uh, cell phones, but uh, in such kind of cases, uh, GPS receivers in the mobile phone is not very, let's say, popular. So the, what we can have is just a kind of cell tower location uh, as a kind of proxy for the alternative location of the in individual users. For example, this is the data from Dhaka, and the, the yellow points correspond to the location of the cell towers. So you may see a very huge uh, in the concentration of the cell towers in the center of the Dhaka city. And, uh, movement of the handsets or the Dhaka people actually could be represented as a kind of moving point uh, connecting individual cell tower, for example, locations. So that does not look so fancy or real uh, compared with the movie created from the GPS. And also this is the very early in the morning, so we may just accelerate something like this. And also, in this case, the location is recorded whenever they make a phone call. And actually, at this moment, what we have is just a voice call location. So the, such kind of movement actually is a kind of artifact because uh, such kind of movement must be created through the uh, interpolation. But nevertheless, we could identify some sort of the moving, for example, patterns. And uh, such kind of moving patterns could be 
summarize like this kind of let's say origin and destination data. Actually, such kind of data uh, is a kind of basis for traffic management because it represents the demand for movement or anyway transportation facilities or systems. But at the same time, uh, we may make uh, more, let's say, advanced or intelligent uh, interpolations. So the actually this is a result of the interpolation. And yeah, for such kind of interpolation, of course, we have to combine uh, some kind of behavior model of the DACA people. And uh, based on that, we try to estimate uh, which route they may take. So then, this is a kind of uh, interpolated results. So it looks a little bit more realistic. And also by counting the number of such kind of uh, moving points along with the networks, we can, let's say, estimate uh, some kind of traffic, I mean, volume of the individual uh, major street links. So the, uh, fortunately, yeah, the correlation coefficient I'm not shown here, but it's something like a 0 0.7 or anything, something like this. Not very high, but not so bad. So uh, anyway, uh, by combining the course observation data with some kind of let's say, behavior models or movement models, uh, we can downscale such kind of course resolution data for the better estimate. And uh, of course, in the context of the developing countries, there is a lot of demand for the moving features. Uh, actually, this comes from the science paper uh, published by the Howard School of the Public Health. And according to that, actually, the malaria parasite actually migrates from one place to the other uh, with the people, moving people. Uh, this case is Kenya. and. Uh, those areas actually facing to the Lake Victoria, a uh, lot of uh, parasite rate or density. So this is the origin of the parasites. And this is, this location is Kenya, capital city. So it attracts a lot of seasonal workers, even from the areas facing the Lake Victoria. So together with the seasonal workers, actually the parasite will be, I mean, brought from Lake Victoria to the, I mean, the Kenya, uh, sorry, the Nairobi. And uh, since there are enemy, many hospitals in Nairobi, actually, those parasites will be actually demolished. So this is a uh, source and also a kind of thing. And uh, such kind of analysis actually could be applied to the different countries suffering from the malaria, especially the drug-resistant malaria in Southeast Asia. I believe that they will start a similar kind of survey in Cambodia and uh, probably Laos. So such kind of uh, articles are, let's say, uh, depicted in the MIT Technology Review in 2013 as one of the 10 breakthrough technologies. OK, so then, going back to a little bit standard, uh, because probably I'm, this is one of my mission to talk about something about the standards. So the, actually, there are a lot of moving feature data. And, uh, but as I mentioned, the, such kind of moving feature data must be combined with other data sources, typically background map data, background environmental data, but at the same time, some sort of the simulation, for example, data. That is also are uh, represented by a collection of the moving feature data. <coughs> but, uh, however, there is no such kind of standard for the data exchange. That is a start point. And at the beginning, we have investigated what kind of uh, standards could be applied for representing such kind of moving features or uh, temporary changing uh, geographic data. And for this column, the moving feature, for example, data, uh, very fortunately, the ISO 19141 uh, described uh, some sort of the conceptual models, but uh, not nothing for the implementation. And it was uh, actually developed or uh, published in 2008. So that means almost, let's say, six years have passed without doing anything for the implementation. 
So the, we define the target here, developing a kind of implementation standard for exchanging the data. Then we provide, as I mentioned, two different kind of the uh, standard, part one, part two. Uh, part one, of course, is based on the tradition of the GML, or heritage of GML. It's based on the XML. But at the same time, the, there are many features, 3D, 2D, 1D, or something like this. So actually, at this moment, we just focus on the moving, let's say, points, just the zero D I mean, features, because many of the moving features are represented by just the moving points. So then, the moving point features for XML core, and the, actually the number of such kind of moving features are quite, in many cases, very many. Uh, for example, in the case of the dark uh, data, it comes from the 6 million uh, unique ID, and I don't remember the exact uh, number of the records, but uh, anyway, we have to exchange the very huge amount of the data. So then, the simple encoding, such as a simple CSV, may help. So that is the reason why I provide the part two. So then, I go back to the first slide. Thank you for your support. And the, actually, uh, oh, amazingly, uh, there are not so many tools. I mean, it's very easy, but still uh, fancy tools that allow us to visualize the moving point data. Actually, the, the movies, I showed was created by this tool. Uh, that tool is called MobMap. And the MobMap is just a kind of plugin. And also, this is a reference implementation of that standard. And actually, the MobMap is a kind of plugin for the Google Chrome. And uh, I believe that. Just type mobile map, then you can go there and you can download the ENA version 2, that would be much better. And uh, anyway, uh, using such kind of visualization tools, you can just easily, uh, let's say, visualize of your trajectory or anyway, uh, series of the uh, timestamp and also the coordinates, for example, values. Probably that is the end of my talk. Anyway, thank you very much. Right, excellent. Okay, we definitely have a couple of minutes for questions. Has anybody got questions for Professor Shisaki? No? George? So the phone data that you get, the cellular phone data, comes as call data records, the CDRs. Yes, CDR, yes. And how, do you, how does that relate to moving features? Is there a lot of transformation that is needed to go from CDRs to moving features data? What's involved with that? Yes. Uh, actually, the CDR, call detail records, include only the cell tower ID. And that ID must be geocoded of course, converted to the longitude latitude. And uh, calling, actually, the records include the timestamp. So the, actually, uh, the cell tower location and the timestamps. So, but actually, for example, in order to make uh, any fancy movie or whatever, we have to make some kind of interpolation. So then, the, by combining some kind of root choice behavior of the people, we can make a realistic Interpolation, but uh, if you don't, just uh, such as the linear interpolation or something like this. So anyway, that could be a very good start point for moving feature data generation. And so, if, if the, the CDRs, their location information is a cell tower ID. Yeah. And there must be a database then that goes from cell tower ID to lat long or some other coordinate. Exactly. And exactly. is that hard to get? Is that an easy? database for you to uh, get that database of cell tower locations or 
I, I, I don't know much about how easy it is, but of course we needed to have a kind of NDA because the location of Sal Towers actually uh, represents some sort of the marketing strategy of individual cell phone operators. So they don't want to share such kind of data with the others, but actually such kind of publications we work with the ADB, Asian Development Bank, or sometimes Work World Bank, or something like this. So under such kind of I mean project, we have NDA and uh, can have such kind of data. Since I can reach you. you get the <laughs> A short question. Sorry. Um, did you, what, what kind of application do you think you could provide for, from this kind of data regarding uh, urban planning? Uh, for instance, air pollution or the correlation with uh, long use data? Did you already start some uh, application? Ah, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, that is a very good question because at this moment we are now working with the medical school of the University of Tokyo uh, for the public health and actually they are working uh, kind of the health impact of the air pollution in Dhaka city and uh, so far the exposure of such kind of polluted airs are computed or estimated just based on the nighttime location or nighttime anyway, population distribution but apparently, the main people go in and out of such kind of polluted, concentrated area. So they, anyway, their idea is why not, let's say, include such kind of movement. So anyway, they are now making the analysis. So anyway, probably not yet published. But uh, I believe there is a lot of demands from such kind of public health researchers. Just a comment. Uh, Okay, just a comment. Uh, thank you for your very interesting presentation. I really liked all these movies. Uh, just greetings from uh, ISOTC 211 meeting in, in Shenzhen, China last week. Uh, I'm there acting as a head of Finnish delegation and what we actually agreed upon is that in the future we are not only developing these UML conceptual uh, standards, but in parallel also XML and other schema implementations. So I hope we won't have the situation like we had in this case, that you have to wait for six years and to do it by your own. Thank you for OTC working within this <laughs> paradigm. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much.